So our next session is called Transitioning Industries and Global Trade, what Oscar was talking to us about at the beginning. What is the effect of all this regional climate policy that's being made going to have on economic fairness, on job creation, and on global trade? Does it challenge some WTO shibboleths or not? And what effect is the climate policy going to have on the strategic decarbonization programs of big companies, the big emitters in Europe and elsewhere? That's what we're going to be focusing on. So please put your hands together now to look at what the energy transition means from the point of view of a big energy player, Equinor. Please welcome Helga Haugener, Senior Vice President for Gas and Power from Equinor. Thank you, Nisha. And apologies for using some extra transition time to get up here. Uh, and I should probably also make another apology. Uh, I think I will come across as somewhat less optimistic uh, compared to the two previous speakers, but I really enjoyed listening to them. And if you use artificial intelligence and try to make a picture with it, and the words that you insert is Europe on crutches. This is apparently what the artificial intelligent, uh, intelligence would do. And standing here today on crutches, uh, you know, it was just too tempting to try to make an analogy of Europe's energy situation. So in my case, I was overconfident when I entered something called the Extreme Eidfjord Marathon. I think the name should have given it away. Uh, and now I'm suffering uh, the consequences of that. But I've also decided that I will never, ever enter a mountain marathon again. If I then go to Europe, I think it's fair to say that Europe was also overconfident when we decided to take down flexible energy before we had built out the alternatives. And now we're suffering the consequences in Europe. And in terms of the future, I'm not quite sure Europe has learned its lesson. So in the few minutes that has been allotted to me, I will try to cover quite a bit. Um, the past, uh, which is really going to be what we've done wrong. The present, what we are facing right now. And then to the future, what I believe we need to do to get this right. And I will mainly focus on Europe, but I think it's important that we all keep in mind that it's a global problem that we actually need to solve in the end. So first, I want to talk a little bit about the past and what we've done wrong. And what you see here is the volatility that we have seen in gas prices. The chart shows the high and the low of gas prices in Europe week by week. And I realize most of you probably don't relate to euro per megawatt hour on a daily basis. But if I convert this to oil price, and you take week 10 as the example, this would be the same as oil price moving from around $200 per barrel to almost $700 per barrel in one single week. And to put this further in perspective, even during the first 20 weeks that you see at the start of this chart, this was the time when people in Equinor came to me. I'm heading up gas and power in Equinor. They came to me and said, it must be so interesting to work in gas and power right now. We have never seen anything like this. And the word unprecedented was used a lot already when describing that period. So I can tell you it was quite stressful the year that followed after those first 20 weeks you see here. And it's also important to note that the issues arise before Russia took down their production. Because Europe had started to take down flexible and baseload generation, this is typically coal, nuclear and gas, before we had built out the sufficient alternatives. We lived by an illusion that renewables could quickly replace all the other energy we needed. And that did not happen. And what we did get was a lot of volatility and a lot of trouble. And that brings me to the present time. I hope we have now started to realize how difficult this transition actually is. And you all have probably heard the saying that renewables are now cheaper than fossil fuels. And that is true if you live in Chile and you think about energy during peak sun hours. 
but both timing and location of energy is, is important. So the slide that you now see here was a quick and dirty that I got from our analysts when I asked them to try to force solve for Europe's power system. This is replacing all coal, all gas and all nuclear with renewables. What will it take? And here we also convert some of the power to hydrogen to then deal with the storage issue that you then will have. And this one here behind me is very simplified because we assume perfect connectivity between markets. We assume that all storage and grid connection just magically appear. And even then, we see that the task is enormous. And this means that only doing this for a small fraction of the world, because we need to remember that Europe only has around 13% of global primary energy demand. So even for this small part, what we're facing is extremely difficult. So then you can imagine getting this done at a global scale. So I'm convinced that more renewables will be crucial if we're going to deliver on energy security and climate goals. What I'm uncertain about is how fast we are able to do it. And that's why I'm getting this pessimist that I said in the beginning. And that brings me to the future where I'm afraid it is easier to provide questions than firm answers. So sorry about that, Asgeir, but we'll discuss later as well, I guess. What is positive is that the climate realities are very widely acknowledged. What I think is less positive is that the energy realities, I believe, are less so. There's a lack of realism when we're discussing what it takes. We talk a lot about a trilemma, you know, the affordability, climate, security. But of course, it's going to be much harder than that. I believe you need to consider feasibility. You know, having a plan that is actually doable, and that would make it into a quadrilemma. And this is not only about Europe and the affordability of the rich part of the world. Limiting carbon will require that developing countries cannot take the same path as the developed countries have done. And in terms of figuring out how to do this, we are definitely not on track. And it's a good thing that China is now number one in solar and wind development. They're adding around 165 gigawatts of new capacity this year. That's great. But last year, China initiated 86 gigawatts of new coal power. That was double from the year before. How do we deal with that? Around 600 million people, sub-Sahara, don't even have access to electricity. We cannot expect them to pay more than the developed world did. What about the two billion new consumers we will have in 2050? Half of them also living in Africa. And should we really deal with this by introducing barriers for accessing the riches that we have built in the developed world by cheap energy to begin with? And this is one thing I'm sure we'll discuss a bit in the panel afterwards. But to make the transition work, we need to make it just. And that would form the trilemma into a pentalemma. And I had to look up that word, but apparently that's what it's called. So in closing, I would like to say that I'm proud to work for a big energy producer. In Equinor, we try to address the totality of what is needed. And we will invest heavy in renewables, we can promise that because we need all we can get of renewables. But we're still going to be a proud producer of natural gas for decades, and we're working with low-carbon solutions, because that's where we can take out the carbon, provide blue hydrogen, and do this virtually with no carbon footprint. In that way, we hope we can help industrial players, such as ArcelorMittal, which you'll soon hear from. So we will do our best. And I actually hope that many students from NTNU, uh, so that goes against some of the questions here before, and perhaps some of the audience today will help us doing just that in the future. Because solving the energy crisis is going to be much more than just renewable. And yes, you're also going to need a little bit of oil for quite a while going forward. But voters, politicians, regulators, companies, investors, and academia all have to work in the same direction. And to do that, 
we need to be open about how difficult this actually will be. Because if we can't find a feasible, and if we can't find a just transition, I'm sure it actually will not happen. Thank you for your attention, and sorry for being a little bit more pessimistic than the previous speakers.